Today we're going to read Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. We were all sitting around the big kitchen table. It was Saturday morning, pancake morning. Mom was squeezing oranges for juice. Henry and I were betting on how many pancakes we could each eat. And Grandpa was doing the flipping. Seconds later, something flew through the air and headed towards the kitchen ceiling and landed right on Henry. After we realized that the flying object was only a pancake, we all laughed, even Grandpa. Breakfast continued quite uneventfully. All the other pancakes landed in the pan and all of them were eaten, even the one that landed on Henry. That night, touched off by the pancake incident at breakfast, Grandpa told us the best tall tale bedtime story he'd ever told. Across an ocean, over lots of huge bumpy mountains, across three hot deserts and one smaller ocean, there lay the tiny town of Chew and Swallow. In most ways, it was very much like any other tiny town. It had a main street lined with stores, houses with trees and gardens around them a schoolhouse, about 300 people, and some assorted cats and dogs. But there were no food stores in the town of Chew and Swallow. They didn't need any. The sky supplied all the food they could possibly want. The only thing that was really different about Chew and Swallow was the weather. It came three times a day, at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everything that everyone ate came from the sky. Whatever the weather served, that was what they ate. But it never rained there. It never snowed there. And it never blew just wind. It rained things like soup and juice. It snowed mashed potatoes and green peas. And sometimes the wind blew in storms of hamburgers. The people could watch the weather report on television in the morning. And they would even hear a prediction for the next day's food. When the townspeople went outside, they carried their plates, cups, glasses, forks, spoons, knives, and napkins with them. That way, they would always be prepared for any kind of weather. If there were leftovers, and there usually were, the people took them home and put them in their refrigerators, in case they got hungry in between meals. The menu varied. By the time they woke up in the morning, breakfast was coming down. After a brief shower of orange juice, low clouds of sunny side up eggs moved in, followed by pieces of toast. Butter and jelly sprinkled down for the toast, and most of the time it rained milk afterwards. For lunch one day, Frankfurters, already in their rolls, blew in from the northwest and about, at about five miles an hour. There were mustard clouds nearby, then the wind shifted to the east and brought in baked beans. A drizzle of soda finished off the meal. Dinner one night consisted of lamb chops, becoming heavy at times with occasional ketchup. Periods of peas and baked potatoes were followed by gradual clearing with the most wonderful jello setting in the West. The sanitation department of Chew and Swallow had a rather unusual job for a sanitation department. It had to remove the food that fell on the houses and sidewalks and lawns. The workers cleaned things up after every meal and fed all the cats and dogs. Then they emptied some of it into the surrounding oceans for the fish and turtles and whales to eat. The rest of the food was put back into the earth so that the soil would be richer for the people's flower gardens. Life for the townspeople was delicious until the weather took a turn for the worse. One day, there was nothing but gorgonzola cheese all day long. And the next day were Brussels sprouts and peanut butter with mayonnaise. The next day, there was only broccoli, all overcooked. Another day, there was a pea soup fog, so no one could see where they were going and they could barely find the rest of the meal that got stuck in the fog. The food was getting larger and larger, and so were the portions. The people were getting frightened. Violent storms blew up frequently. 
awful things were happening. One Tuesday, there was a hurricane of bread and rolls all day long into the night. There were soft rolls and hard rolls, some with seeds and some without. There was white bread and rye and whole wheat toast. Most of it was larger than they had ever seen bread and rolls before. It was a terrible day. Everyone had to stay indoors. Roofs were damaged and the sanitation department was beside itself. The mess took the workers four days to clean up and the sea was full of floating rolls. To help out, the people piled up as much bread as they could in their backyards. The birds picked at it a bit, but it just stayed there and got staler and staler. There was a storm of pancakes one morning and a downpour of maple syrup that nearly flooded the town. A huge pancake covered the school. No one could get it off because of the weight, so they had to close the school. Lunch one day brought 15 inch drifts of cream cheese and jelly sandwiches. Everyone ate themselves sick and the day ended with a stomach ache. There was an awful salt and pepper wind accompanied by an even worse tomato tornado. People were sneezing themselves silly and running to avoid the tomatoes. The town was a mess. There were seeds and pulp everywhere. The sanitation department gave up. The job was too big. Everyone feared for their lives. They couldn't go outside most of the time. Many houses had been badly damaged by giant meatballs. Stores were boarded up and there was no more school for the children. So a decision was made to abandon the town of Chew and Swallow. It was a matter of survival. The people glued together the giant pieces of stale bread sandwich style with peanut butter. It took, er, took the absolute necessities with them and set sail on their rafts for a new land. After being afloat for a week, they finally reached a small coastal town, which welcomed them. The bread had held up surprisingly well, well enough for them to build temporary houses out of it. The children began school again, and the adults all t tried to find places for themselves in the new land. The biggest change they had to make was getting used to buying food at a supermarket. They found it odd that people, that food was kept on shelves, packaged in boxes, cans, and bottles. Meat that had to be cooked was kept in large refrigerators. Nothing came down from the sky except rain and snow. The clouds above their heads were not made of fried eggs. No one ever got hit by a hamburger again. And nobody dared to go back to Chew and Swallow to find out what had happened to it. They were too afraid. And nobody, Henry and I were awake until the very end of Grandpa's story. I remember his goodnight kiss. The next morning, we woke up to see snow falling outside our window. We ran downstairs for breakfast and ate it a little faster than usual so we could go sledding with Grandpa. It's funny that even as we were sledding down the hill, we thought we saw a giant pat of butter on the, at the top and we could almost smell the mashed potatoes. The end. Good morning, everyone. I'm Audrey Foster and I'm the summer intern at Nebraska Extension in Custer County. I'm excited to have you all here today, whether you are here as part of the library program for Broken Bow or as part of our 4-H crew. So today we're going to be learning about the weather and then covering the truth about the weather. After, since we've read our story about the weather, now we're going to move into more of the facts and myths about the weather. So to get us started today, I want to talk about some of the myths that we commonly hold about the weather. So to begin, let's start with a Nebraska legend. According to the Skitty Pawnee Indian lore, clouds were our clothing for the gods of heaven. The sky god wears the cloud garment. When he spreads his arm, the clouds, or garments, stretch across the sky. Do you guys know what the windiest city in the U.S. is? Oftentimes, we think Chicago, because Chicago has the nickname of the windiest city. But this wasn't necessarily derived from the weather, but from recording to the bluster of the city's politicians. Among the populated cities and towns in the lower 48 states, so continental U.S., 
Um, Dodge City, Kansas is the windiest city on average. Also, Boston, Oklahoma City, and Honolulu are also all windier than Chicago in the average year. Okay, next myth. How many of you guys have heard the myth that lightning never strikes the same place twice? I know I have, but this is actually false because tall pointed isolated objects have a strong enough electric field to be struck repeatedly. For instance, the Empire State Building in New York City is struck approximately a hundred times a year. <laughs> and if a thunderstorm is slow moving, some lightning prone locations can get struck multiple times in a single thunderstorm. Also, Roy Sullivan, a park ranger, was struck seven different times, the most of anyone on record. So now that we've discussed a few of these myths, let's get into some activities that deal with the weather. To begin today, we're gonna discuss clouds. Clouds are a collection of very tiny little water droplets and ice crystals that float around in the air. And they're able to float because they're so small and light. Near the ground, moisture in the air is in the form of water vapor. And clouds are formed when that warm air rises, expands, and then cools. The cooler air can't hold that moisture and then it condenses around dust particles in the atmosphere that come together. When the water droplets and ice crystals continue to collect in a cloud, they get heavier and heavier. They eventually become so heavy that they are too heavy to float in the air and they drop to the ground. So to experiment with this, we have a quick activity. Okay. So to learn about clouds, once again, we're gonna have a bowl or jar filled almost to the top with water, shaving cream, it needs to be foam shaving cream, not gel, and then food coloring. So to start out, like I said, we're gonna fill our bowl or jar almost completely full of water. Then we're gonna top it off with some shaving cream. So we're gonna put a nice layer on top. Oh, better shake that a little more. This shaving cream is almost out, so hopefully you guys will have a little bit more to it. Okay, so that right now is symbolizing our cloud. It's moisture particles and everything that are floating around in the air. They're really lightweight, so they're able to stay up in the air. Just like how, and they haven't penetrated the water. Just like our clouds stay in the air because they're so light until they become heavy enough that they go through the air, if that makes sense. So. Now we're gonna add in our food coloring, which symbolizes the air particles collecting and getting heavier, combining with dust particles. So we're gonna drip a few on and we're gonna see what happens. You guys will also have to do this at home so that you can see a little bit clearer what happens. So as you can see there, they're starting to drip down. Oh, my lighting's not the best. But this is where you guys will get to do it at home. And just as the rain collects and the particles collect with the dust and they drip down, so is this food coloring from our cloud. So for this next demonstration, we're gonna be looking at convection currents. So right now you're probably thinking, Audrey, what do you mean by convection current? Well, a convection current is what happens when hot air meets cool air. So hot air tends to rise in our atmosphere and cool air sinks. As these two rise and sink, you get a current or a movement happening that creates kind of a cycle. So that's what we're gonna be exploring in this next activity is how hot air and cool air interact. Except we're gonna be using water and more food coloring. So for this demonstration, what you're gonna need is a clear shoebox or shoebox shaped container or larger filled with water. Now this water, you need to wait till it's completely settled before you do this experiment. This represents the air in our atmosphere. You're also going to need some food coloring. I'm going to use red. This represents the warm air. So warm red, that makes sense. Then I've also prepared some blue ice cubes. So these are just blue water that I added in a drop of blue food coloring to each one. These represent the cold air. So cold, blue, warm, hot, or warm, red. So for this, what we're gonna do 
is I filled my container halfway full or a little more with warm water, which we're gonna add red food coloring into. And I've prepared my blue ice cubes. So to begin, I'm gonna gently add a couple of my blue ice cubes to one side of the bin. Okay. And then I am going to very carefully add a couple of drops of red food coloring to the other side of the bin. And I want to be very careful not to disturb this bin of water. And as we're waiting here, carefully observe what's going on. And we'll notice that it doesn't take long for this red air to rise and for the blue air, or the blue water, red water, to sink. That's kind of how convection currents work in our atmosphere. The warm air, or red water, rises, and the blue water, or cold air, sinks. This is what goes on in our world all around us. I think that it's kind of incredible watching how the blue water just automatically sinks and the red air rises because every type of water, every type of air knows exactly where it wants to be and it's gonna do anything it can to get there, just like our atmosphere. That's kind of the point of convection currents is everything wants to be, knows where it's supposed to be and is gonna try hard to get there, just like our water is doing that right here. Our final activity today is gonna to be a design challenge and you're gonna be tasked with creating an anemometer. So what's an anemometer you may be asking? Well, it's a tool that scientists use to measure wind. It measures not only the speed of wind, but also the direction of wind. So today the challenge is that you get to, the, to design your own using a set of strict materials. However, before I introduce these materials to you guys, I want you to keep in mind that you don't necessarily have to go with this alone. Think about scientists. They're constantly learning from each other and each other's research. They're reading at the library. They're researching on the internet. Use your resources. Use that internet. Use the library. Use your friends and see what you guys can come up with. So now let's take a look at our materials. Today, you will to, to, to create your anemometers, you can use the following materials. Your phone for a stopwatch a fan to test your anemometer, a single hole punch, markers, five Dixie cups or three ounce small cups, two straws, a pencil with a sharpened end and an eraser, and a thumbtack. Once again, thank you guys for joining us for today's library program or for today's June Jamboree. I look forward to seeing you guys next time and to hearing about you guys' results with the weather.